first session in the afternoon will be a panel discussion on the subject of the future of scientific publishing. Uh, the panel is um, semi-complete. Uh, by this I mean that all the panelists are in the building, but not uh, everybody is on the stage. Um, but we can be quite optimistic about um, the final further outcome. The panel will be moderated by Gerard Meyer, Gerard Meyer, well, you pronounce it correctly, please. Uh, I'm um, from the Max Planck Society in Berlin. Uh, the other panelists will be introduced in due course, and I don't want to steal any more of their time and pass on to uh, Gerard Meyer. Thank you very much. I don't think I should use two microphones, and I, and I, hope, um, and I hope this microphone um, works. Let me, um, let me first start by, um, by thanking the organizers of this forum to reserve the time to have a panel discussion on this topic that I think is of uh, utmost importance. It's in particular of utmost importance to the very many young people in the audience. And although we are sitting here with a panel and we will start the discussion and we will start with, uh, with statements from our side, um, this discussion is going to be most useful if in particular also the young people in the audience stand up and vow their concerns, come up with their questions or maybe suggestions on how things can be improved. And so I really, at the beginning of this, I invite you all um, to do this, to, to think about issues that are, um, that are important uh, to you. What we thought we will do in this, um, in this panel discussions, each of the members of the panel will uh, briefly introduce him or herself and um, also saying what the connection is to the scientific publishing business. And um, I also, we, we also all made kind of an introductory statement um, that we would um, like people to, to know and that that might be a good basis for discussion. And um, I think, I mean, we, we, we were sitting in this order. We will, um, we will show the different slides. I will just start with um, um, saying some, some words on myself and how I got into this. And, um, and, and then also my statement will be, will be shown up there. Uh, so my name is Gerard Meyer. I'm Dutch. I'm a director at the Max, Max Planck Institute in Berlin, the Fritz Haber Institute of the Max Planck Society. Uh, I'm a physicist, experimental physics. Um, the Fritz Haber Institute is kind of researches on the border between chemistry and physics. And um, I got involved in, in open access of scientific publications when I joined the Max Planck Society in 2003. Actually, my colleague director then uh, organized the first Berlin open access meeting in which the Berlin Declaration on Open Access was signed in 2003. Um, I was not very actively involved in that in the beginning. In 2012, I moved back to the Netherlands and I became president of the Radboud University in Nijmegen. And at that point, I coordinated the activity on behalf of all the Dutch universities uh, in the negotiations with the book publishers. We found, we, we, we were of the opinion that things should be changed in the present publication model and that we should negotiate um, different contracts with the publishers that we, than we had done in the past. And in particular, that all the publications, in that case from Dutch institutions, should um, immediately be published open access at no extra cost for the researcher. In 2017, I came back to Berlin and, um, and I've been involved in the German-wide negotiations in the framework, the Germans know this, the DEAL project. DEAL stands for Deutsche Allianz Lizenzen, so national licenses to be negotiated with the publishers on access to the journals and on open access of scientific publications. And uh, so, so that has been my involvement. And um, the statement that, um, that I would like to make at the beginning is, um, is up there. And um, I always start by saying that dissemination of scientific results is an integral part of a research project. And that's why the cost of scientific publication should be carried by that same research project, that is by the authors or by the funding institution. Um, in addition, and it should then be freely accessible for everybody to read and to reuse. In addition, the copyrights should stay, I would say, where they belong, namely with the authors, and the cost of scientific publications should be transparent. 
Okay, so enough said from my side. We're just going to uh, make the round, so I, I pass on to if himself enough to introduce, he hardly needs to introduce himself, but he will nevertheless do this, and maybe tell um, about a side of his that you all know a little bit less about. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yefim Zelmanov. I am a mathematician, and I am a member of many editorial boards of mathematical journals. I think that uh, the open access model where authors pay absolutely does not work in the field of mathematics. It may work perfectly in biology, chemistry, and experimental physics. Uh, in several editorial boards, we were recently informed by publishing houses that we switch to this open access model, and this is not negotiable by Springer, by De Gruyter. By the unanimous decision of editorial boards, we switched publishers. Okay, that's a very clear uh, statement and, an, and a very interesting uh, viewpoint. Um, so, one panel member, unfortunately, is still missing, although I saw her before um, here. But then we just pass on to Julia Williamson. Williamson. Hi, my name is Julie Rico Williamson, and I'm a faculty member at the University of Glasgow. Uh, I'm in the area of HCI for non-planar displays. Um, but my interest in publications kind of started when I first joined the ACM Future of Computing Academy. Some of you here in the room might actually have applied to our recent recruiting process. Uh, best of luck, it's a wonderful organization to be involved with. Um, and so when I first joined the FCA, um, I chaired the Future of Publications Working Group, and we were very interested in things like bias in peer review, open peer reviewing, and open science. And that's how I got interested in these kind of publication matters. I joined the ACM Publications Board about two years ago, uh, and I sit on the Ethics and Plagiarism Subcommittee and on the Digital Library Technology Subcommittee. So I'm very interested in the archiving practices in the digital library uh, and policies that govern all matters of publication from um, conflict of interest to author name changes to retraction and withdrawal policy. I'm just very interested in this kind of um, how we uh, deal with publications at the ACM level. But I also um, am the SIGCHI Vice President for Publications, uh, so I have a lot of uh, experience with some of the practical implementation of these policies as well. And for my SIGCHI work, I think a lot about author experience and accessibility and archiving practices and how that influences and uh, changes the author experience. And often we're seeing more and more uh, work being put onto authors, which is also a challenge when um, we're thinking about the cost of publication. So there's kind of two main issues that are close to my heart. Um, and the first one uh, is one that specifically deals with early career researchers. Uh, so I'm very happy to, to represent early career researchers as well on this panel. Um, but I think that we really need to think about a culture of publishing less, um, not only so that we produce fewer publications of higher quality, um, but also to think about things about strain on the reviewing community um, and the kind of potential dilution of the scientific record um, I think it's important to think about what's the size of a contribution and what's the reason that we choose to publish. The second thing, which is probably closely related as well to open access, is also just open science practices more generally. Um, an open culture of sharing ideas, being transparent, making data sets available, making analysis scripts available, making research reproducible and very transparent from the very early stages of uh, planning an experiment or planning some work. And I think this is really important, not only because of the open access issue, but also to increase uh, public trust in science um, and making sure that all of our practices are open and available and reproducible. Thank you very much. And then we continue with Klaus Hulek. My name is Klaus Hulek. I'm a mathematician from Leibniz University in Hanover. Uh, I've been involved with publishing from many different angles, obviously as an author, as a referee, as an editor. Uh, but I was also vice president of research of my university and at that time uh, the library of Hanover was part of my portfolio and this is the national library for mathematics, sciences and engineering. So I saw it from the library point of view. I am currently editor-in-chief of ZB Math. ZB Math is the European equivalent of Math Signet. So we are the biggest database uh, for mathematical publications and reviews. Um, and we're obviously, uh, from that point of view, very much interested in 
how will publishing change? And finally, I'm currently vice president of the German Mathematical Society, DMV, and just yesterday we passed a uh, motion on the use of bibliometrics in research assessment. I would like to make three points. Uh, the first is something we practically all can agree on, or easily can agree on, most of us at least. Publicly funded research should be publicly accessible. Uh, if we discuss that with colleagues, I get very little, very, I do not expect anybody to contradict me. And then a little bit later on in the discussion, I say, well, there is open access, open access will do that for us. And then the discussion can get very emotional. Uh, somebody might say, yeah, but I've done all the work, I've done all the time setting, uh, and now I also have to pay for publishing. Why should I do that? That's a stupid model. There's another answer one sometimes gets, and that's quite a high uh, power argument. In Germany, and we have in the Constitution the freedom of teaching and research. And I've heard people say, this is against the freedom of research because I want to decide where I want to publish it, and I do not want anybody to decide that for me. Uh, this is an argument I've not so often heard from mathematicians, but I do have, I have heard it from the, chemi, uh, from the chemists quite a bit, in fact. Mostly from the publishers, but sometimes also from science. The last point I would like to make is that the role of publishing has changed very much. 50, 60 years ago, this was the dissemination of knowledge. You went to the library, you took out the journal, and you found out something new. This is no longer the way it works. We put it on archive, everybody can see it tomorrow. But we still have a long and complicated refereeing process, publication process, and I think the whole purpose of that is quality control and evaluation. And it's important where young research, but also older researchers, publish their paper because that influences their careers and their chances to obtain grants. And I think that adds a lot of inertia to the system and does make it much harder to change to open access. So that's my introduction. I, I would suggest that we now first welcome Gabrielle van Voigt as, as panel member and we go two steps back and ask her to introduce herself and, and give a general statement. Okay, first of all, I'm very, very sorry to be late. I do apologize for that. Okay, I would like to yeah, introduce myself I'm not a person who won all these prizes like some of our honored guests did. I'm not these ones. I'm just a normal computer scientist. I studied computer science at the Technical University of Berlin. I wrote my PhD and my habilitation in the application of virtual reality and yeah, human-computer interaction within medicine. And um, I worked as a normal software developer in companies, in quite a few companies I worked. I worked as a production head of the production for a multimedia company, which was very, very interesting for me as a computer scientist to work together with all these creative people. But I also worked at uh, a lecturer at UCL, University College London, and Crete. I was on Crete, which was a very good experience for me as well. And um, yeah, I worked in a university hospital. I was a head of the IT services there. And maybe one thing to mention at that time, I was the head of the introduction of SAP. SAP you might have heard of. Yeah, so we had unfortunately a year 2000 problem. You young people probably won't know really what this means, but our hardware and our software was basically, didn't run after the beginning of the year 2000. Unbelievable, but true. So therefore we had exactly one year to introduce SAP all over the hospital as a big bang with 2,500 users, nurses may, mainly. You can imagine how nurses work with a computer, okay? You might do, especially at that time, and doctors, and of course administration. Yeah, and that was a good, a nice challenge for me, and thank God for that we were successful. But as I said, uh, it was a challenge, and it, I think I learned something from that one, if you, have a, if you face a big challenge, go for it. That's basically one thing I learned. Afterwards, I run a computing center at a university. Klaus Hulek and I, we work together. I work at the Leibniz University as well, and now my group is called Computational Health Informatics. 
So I think health is a good area for researchers to be at. But maybe, do I have one more minute? Sure. Okay, I get one more minute. Uh, maybe one thing, I, I don't know if anyone else mentioned any hobbies. I'm quite into sports. Why do I say that? I mean, I used to start with ballet, which you can't see anymore really from my, the way how I walk. I played, oh, I swam first, I was, I was a professional swimmer, or not professional, competitive swimmer. And I played water polo. The best thing I ever achieved was coming third in the European Championships, which is not that much, and now I play tennis. Why do I mention it? For me, personally, I need sports in order to sort of refresh my brain. So I did quite a lot of sports, I'm quite into sports, and whoever is the same, I just would like to encourage, keep on going, doing it. It's not only that your brain will refresh, you also have the challenge to go for another competition, not only the intellectual one, which we do normally at work. So, but that's only one thing I do. Next to my work, I'm the delegate from Germany within the e-infrastructure reflection group. As I said, I'm a computer scientist. I was nominated by the Bundes, um, BMBF Ministry of uh, Research and Education. And two and a half years ago, I got elected as a chair from this group. So if you're interested in e-infrastructures, we look into um, these things within Europe. So we just published a new publication on national nodes, which deals with basically the e-infrastructures within all the European countries. And this with respect to the EOSC principle, you might have heard of EOSC, that's the European Open Science Cloud. And this open brings me, yeah, funnily enough now to my topic, open and publication. Personally, do I have my slides? Yes. I think open is not enough. I would go for fair, not only because I come from sports and I like this term fair, but fair meaning findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So that's for me much more than just open. What it means for us in the future in order to realize this principle is first of all technical aspects like the data exchange format, these totally normal things, but also the change of culture and to give the people who make their documentation and their code and their implementation and everything fair, give them proper incentives. That's, I think, we have to work on us older ones yeah, in the near future. Thank you <coughs> very much. And then, Josef Konstan. Yes, so I'm Joe Konstan. I'm professor of computer science and the associate dean for research in science <coughs> and engineering at the University of Minnesota, where science and engineering includes mathematics and computer science. Uh, but the reason I'm here is because I co-chair ACM's publications board, where we deal with overseeing our dozens of journals and the policies and operations of our hundreds of conference proceedings a year, our uh, books program, and the many other publishing uh, ventures that we undertake. Uh, I'm going to try to focus not so much on a position, but to frame some of the issues. And I'm going to frame five. Uh, I've never heard a researcher say, I don't want certain people to have access to my publications. I think the challenge with open access is not whether, it's how. And it's how do we have open access for readers without shutting off open access to authors particularly authors who may not have the sources of funding for their research, who may be working alone or in environments or countries where the resources aren't there to pay for it. And how do we make sure that open access provides one of the other things publishers still do today, which is making things archivable and findable. Because if you look today, a large number of papers, not just from 20 years ago, but from five years ago, have simply disappeared when they were posted and someone reorganized a website and then that domain went down and maybe they're somewhere but you can't find them anymore. Second, how do we move beyond preserving papers, sets of words and tables, to preserving the artifacts of research to support replication and reuse? How do we archive the data and the code? 
Third, how do we publish the important negative results and the replication studies that move science forward? One of the things that you're going to see is that I really don't believe publication is important for its own sake. We don't need to publish because we need to publish. We need to publish because that's the best way we've found to advance our fields. And we need to make sure that publication is always secondary to advancing the fields and put to that purpose. Fourth, how do we build and maintain a community of reviewers? This is a huge problem today. If you talk to an editor or associate editor of a journal, they will tell stories of asking a dozen or 15 or 20 people to review, some of whom come back and say, I'm too busy, many of whom don't even come back and say anything. If you look at the demographics, it's still the case in many of our fields that the majority of authors are in Western Europe and North America, I'm sorry, the majority of reviewers are in Western Europe and North America, but the authorship base is growing in East and South Asia in a way that we have not yet figured out how to bring the reviewer community along at the same time to balance this out. This is a moment of crisis. And last, I, I share the point that, that Julie raised of how do we address the quantity of publication so that the quantity of publication moves roughly in proportion to the quantity of significant advances in our field and is not driven by some vicious cycle of more is more for its own sake rather than more is more to advance the underlying science. So um, as you'll see in my statement up there, I invite you to get involved in this conversation here today, but as a professional as you move forward, because the answer to these tricky challenges does not come from the people on this stage. It comes from the community building a consensus and then putting the work in to implement it. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction and this statement. Let's leave this slide up. Uh, let's leave the last slide up. Um, because um, this was also the reason that we did this in this order, because this, um, this, this just addresses a lot of very important topics and questions that, that might be on your mind. So I guess we just, with your permission, we just, um, we just leave this up. Actually, sitting here, I'm looking a little bit in, in the darkness. Um, I'm trying to see you as good as possible when you stick up your finger, when you want to say something, ask something. Um, you can also just stand up, then I see you better. Or you can go to one of the microphones and then I'll certainly show you, see you and everybody who uh, goes there and wants to uh, raise a question or say something will get the words for sure. Okay? So I'll do my best to not oversee you, but um, be aware that I'm looking a little bit in the darkness uh, from, from this side. Um, we, will, we will start the discussion a little bit um, from, from our side. I'll try to reflect on the, on the different viewpoints we have heard. Um, I am very well aware that we are here with a, with a special public, I would say, in, in different sense. Also, in particular, mathematics and computer science, it, it is not representative for all the other fields. The different, the different research fields have different uh, publication methods, cultures, histories, uh, different ways of archiving. And so I clearly understand that not all the statements made um, work for all fields equally well. Um, I, I would like to reflect actually on two statements that were, um, that were made that um, you said uh, open access for water spay does not work for mathematics and um, um, I, I also heard the statement why, sh why should the author spay and I would, I would like to say from my point scientists publish for impact not for money. We're a very different crowd. We, we publish for impact, not for money. The scientific publication is let adv like advertising your work. If you put an ad in a newspaper, you normally pay for this ad to be put. A scientific publication is about disseminating your results. It's nothing different than going to a conference, an international conference, and present it to a whole audience. It's interesting that most people take it for granted that when they are invited to an international conference to present their work to an international audience, that of course, I mean, the travel cost there and the accommodation has to be paid from their own research budget. 
people don't take it equally well for granted that the cost of publication, publication does, does cost something, that that is also part of the research project and should simply be paid from the research project and thereafter be free for everybody. So, so this is my answer to the question you posed. Uh, maybe you want I, to react to that. I, I didn't so much pose. This was not meant as an argument against open access. It was just to highlight an argument which one often hears and where there is a mental block sometimes where people just reject the ideas of open access because they have the fear I have to pay or because uh, it could mean that some people who don't have the budgets or from other uni from universities of developing countries might not have the chance to publish. This is the argument one often hears. I think uh, it will help if we make it very clear what are the different options, what does it actually mean, open access. Uh, there are many ways of, of uh, organizing the process and putting this down on a more rational level rather than on this emotional level. So I did not want to use it as an argument against OA, but just highlight it as something one often hears in this discussion. But there is a point because we do have to make sure that everybody can publish even if they do not have the funds uh, in their own pocket uh, to pay for that. Do you want to react to that? Because I, I... Oh yes, <laughs> but before I react, may I ask a question? What do you think would be a reasonable price for an author to pay for a paper? Let me, let me ask you another question because, <laughs> and, there's, and there's a very good reason for that that I ask you this question, because asking for a reasonable price only makes sense if you know what the standard is. You, know, you need to know against what to measure it. So I ask you, are you aware what the scientific community internationally, worldwide, pays in the subscription world per article? No. Right? Okay. Without that, it's a very tough discussion to say whether something is cheap or expensive. The Max Planck Digital Library wrote a white paper. It's the most downloaded paper from the Max Planck Society ever. It's published in 2015. Where to prepare for open access, they said, well, in the case of open access, everybody knows what an article is going to cost because you pay per article. But whether that is a lot or not depends on what did we actually pay in the past. In the past, the publishers got the money because different libraries paid subscription fees to get access to the journals. And so what they did, they basically looked how much money is worldwide paid per year on subscription fees to all the publishers. And that turns out to be 7.6 billion euros per year. How many papers are there per year? A little bit less than 2 million, between 1.8 and 1.9 million. That means, let's round it off to 2 million. That means that the average price, what all of us have been paying, what the, what the scientific community has been paying per article in the subscription world is 3,800 euros per article. That's an average. That's an average over all fields. Mathematics is special, computer science will be special. But this is an average what everybody has been paying. Not a single author has seen this because it was via the libraries, but this is what the income of the publishers was for all the work that the scientists did. So I would say, in answer to your question, everything that is less than on average 3,800 euros per article, then we're better off than we were before. And I think a reasonable price should actually be below 2,000 euros. We have been, excusez le mot, ripped off by the publishers. In thank the you. Now I will continue. After I, thank you for the answer. So you mentioned 2,000 euros. Uh, when we negotiated with Springer, they, they mentioned $1,000. Now I understand that they were very generous. <laughs> uh, but they said it could go up. The average salary of a professor in Russia and Ukraine and many other countries is $500 a month. So 2,000 euros is half a year salary. They do not have any grants. Their work is their individual undertaking. So, if we switch to this model, it means that we shut our journal for people from many countries. In practical terms, that's what it means. So, if I can respond to that, 
I think you've now framed the two sides of this issue very well. That nobody in Russia or elsewhere wants their papers not to be disseminated alongside the top papers coming from Europe or North America. But there's no way that you can charge people in certain places at the same level. I think the challenge here is that we've spent so much time talking about authors paying. And authors paying is not the solution. Institutions paying may be the solution. And institutions are not going to pay in an equal way across the world, just as they don't pay to subscribe in an equal way across the world. And if you talk about a future that will be a fair future, it will be a future in which instead of all of these institutions paying to subscribe, all of these institutions pay different amounts to reflect their ability to publish. The challenge to that today and the reason the transition is so hard is first, paying to publish is variable. Particularly if you're at an institution that last year published two papers and you have a new mathematician who this year wants to submit five, the numbers change rapidly and you need to smooth that out. But the biggest reason this is a problem is it means that our top institutions are going to pay substantially more than they've ever paid before. We've looked at this in a field like computer science, and let's understand what that means. That means that places like EPFL or Tsinghua or MIT are going to pay a lot more than they used to pay in order to ensure that the work that they publish in greater proportion to, than to what they read is readable everywhere you go around the world, from Nigeria to Peru to Russia to elsewhere. And probably a little more on top of that to cover the parts of the world that can't afford to pay. I think we're moving towards that consensus. I think the governments in Europe in particular, but elsewhere as well, are moving towards that. I don't think there's great disagreement. I think it's just been unhelpful to have a bunch of very strong statements. You can use Plan S as an example or others that are saying, wait a minute, authors can't publish here, they can't do this, they can't do that, rather than moving people towards what generally has a consensus but needs to be evolved into a reasonable business model. To, to continue exactly with, um, with the statement that you have made, I mean, the, the, the contracts that are being negotiated with the publishers now in, in different countries, in particular also in Germany, in the deal negotiations, are along the lines that you suggest, namely that the individual authors do not pay, but that the money that was used in the library budget in the past to pay for subscription fees is paid to cover the publication cost, right? And, uh, and there is enough money in the system to do that. Right? So, so, so that, is, that is the argument. I very often indeed hear the point from, also from Heidelberg University for instance, uh, that, that the research intense universities will in the open access system have to pay more for publication than in the past and that is, that, that is unfair. I would, I would like to turn it around. The cost of publications is typically one and a half percent of the cost of a research project. Again, average over all fields. Mathematics and computer science might be slightly different. But this is, this is what it typically is. And I would argue that the system, how it was in the past, namely that the, the small universities that hardly could finance their research and hardly could finance any research still had to use part of their research budget to support the library so that they could at least read what the others did. That was actually more unfair than the situation where we go to where those who do more research indeed also publish more and will have the associated costs as well. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to make a comment on that. I mean, I think read and publish agreements are really exciting and I definitely think that redistribution of wealth uh, is a really good uh, issue, good idea. But I worry how long that goodwill would last uh, once everything's open. Are institutions going to be happy to continue to pay more and more when everything's open? But the question is whether, do you think it will be more and more when everything is open? Do people think it will be more and more when everything is open? Why should it be more and more? I, I think the cost of publication isn't going to go down. So this money is still going to have to flow in from somewhere. 
I would, I, would, I would argue the following. We have thus far, as researchers, done an amazing thing. We have always given the copyrights away to the publishers. The copyrights is the bedrock on which the publishers founded their monopoly position. They had a monopoly. Everybody that wanted this paper had to pay them because they had the copyrights. As soon as the copyrights stay with the authors where they should be, that monopoly position is gone. It will be the first time that you get the free market working in the publishing world. It will change things completely. So I think you're talking about an interesting and potentially exciting future that says what happens, for instance, if you decouple reviewing from the publishing, the final publishing steps so that I get my work reviewed, it comes in with high reviews and I can go to several different journals and say, look at this wonderful thing, will you publish it at your journal at a reasonable price? And I can negotiate that. But I think we also need to recognize, and this is where some of these other issues come up, that there are parts of the publishing model that are broken today because we have tried to not pay for them. And the biggest part of that today is probably the reviewing. It's not simply that you put the effort into writing and formatting. It's that a bunch of other volunteers sitting out there put the effort into giving you the feedback step after step and making the editorial decisions to decide this paper was a paper worth disseminating. And I think we're going to need to recognize that in the future that may be something that has to be paid for as part of the, of the publishing process. I'm going to live up to what I said, that we give people from the audience a chance to ask a question when I see they want to ask a question, so I'm even going to bring her the microphone. I hope this one is on or can be switched on. Uh, yes, thank you. I want to know what the panel members think of a new system that I think IEEE has recently implemented, among others, for Fox, which is one of the big prestigious conferences in theoretical computer science. They established a model where uh, the page limit depend, uh, like what your page limit is depends on how much you pay. Like the first 25 pages are free, and for every page you go over that, you have to pay five dollars. So basically, they're eliminating page limit for rich people, and poor people have to suck it up. Who wants to react? Oh, I'll, I'll react. I hate it. Uh, we've had extreme disagreements with our otherwise collegial colleagues at IEEE over some of the publications ACM and IEEE share together precisely for the reason that you say that, um, one, we believe in the long run the idea of page limits where most publication is digital doesn't make a lot of sense, but two, if you're going to have it, it should be based on the, what the work merits and not based on who has the money to pay for the extra pages as a backdoor way of providing more money into the publishing. Klaus Hüller. I think I object to that quite vehemently because one of the results is to publish shorter papers but many more papers, which means more publications, and this is a point you have made. I think the, just the sheer number of papers should not count. Yeah, we should, if a paper has to be long, it has to be long, it might be a complicated matter which we deal with, this is fine and then it should stay long, but to any kind of mechanism which produces more and more papers I think is detrimental and I would object to that. Just one reaction before I allow that question. Um, I do know that several, it doesn't really address your question exactly, but I knew, do know that several open access publishers they have an APC, article processing charge, that is dependent on the length of the article, which, which, which somehow in a way makes sense because you probably have more work with it when it is substantially longer. Uh, but it is not intended to, to block uh, certain things. It is, it is just kind of a price that is, you pay to say the, the regular price on, for a 15 page uh, article and when it's longer than that, they, they count something, um, something extra. There's another question from the audience. Uh, you mentioned copyright as a back bedrock, but what's the value of copyright if you have free access? Unless uh, Steven Spielberg makes a movie of Ethim's papers, there, there's no value to copyright, is there? Well, I mean, what is the value to copyright? That's a good question. Uh, as you, you probably heard about SciHub, the, the Kazakhstan site 
where uh, a lot of papers are freely available that violates copyrights. Uh, Elsevier sued them in 2016 in the US. If you sue a, a site like that, you have to identify article by article for which you hold the copyright that somebody else made available to everybody. So they sued for exactly 100 articles and identified those 100 articles. They were, uh, of course, Elsevier won that case and they were given 15 million US dollars in penalties, for which I would conclude these copyrights are worth 150,000 dollars per article, right? And, and yeah, 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 yeah. And once with, with, with free access, the copyrights stay with the author. So that's a, a big advantage of open access, that, that the, the copyrights stay with the authors. And normally, under, under a Creative Commons license, you can, you can select uh, how you want to do it. Does anybody else want to react to this? Yeah, maybe just on the copyright thing. I mean, as a computer scientist, it's not just only the publication what you write. At least for me, it was not my code. That was the thing. I did. Uh, I mean, I implemented things and I wanted to have a copyright, of course, on my code. And I think that's copyright is very, very important from that point of view, or at least for computer scientists. Uh, hi, I have a question. Uh, basically, you are about to start to talk about the reviewers and the reviewing process. So perhaps it's uh, a bit far ahead. But um, I was just wondering, uh, so both as a scientist and as a reviewer, I keep hearing uh, conferences like New Europe's, for example, not having enough reviewers. And also, you know, when, for example, when uh, you're applying for funding uh, in, in recommendations, quite always I see people saying that uh, the people reviewing your application are going to see it for maybe 10 minutes. So, you know, you should really write it briefly, etc. cetera. Um, so my question for you, I guess, for all panelists would be, um, do you think that right now we, uh, in both in mathematics and computer science, are experiencing either the shortage of reviewers or the shortage of quality reviewer time? And what should we do about it? Should we move towards some kind of automated reviewing process or something else? Thank you. Yes, I think that it is a huge problem that papers uh, are becoming extremely long and difficult it would take a year of reviewers' work to read it, and therefore um, it doesn't make sense to talk about pay. How can you pay for a year of their work? Ah, there is no universal solution. Editor tries to find referees, bags. <laughs> Klaus Hulek wanted to react. Um, the question is, can we make reviewing part of the track record of a, of a researcher so that you get some acknowledgement for, what, for the work you've put in? Uh, there is one attempt. Uh, I'm not sure it will be successful. There is something called Publons where you can register and then at the end you get the record uh, of how many papers you have refereed. Um, the young people I've spoken to are not very enthusiastic about it, but it's at least theoretically a way of creating some kind of recognition for that work. Um, if we have some ideas in this direction, I think that would already help, because it would then be part of your career, and it would therefore uh, not work in vain, as many people think it is at the moment. Yeah, but how, how many people do know about poplons? Okay, quite a bit. Yeah, tracking doesn't work until people value something. And so, you know, for those of you in your, your first jobs, think about whether the person you report to is going to, at the end of the year, ask the question, have you reviewed enough and well enough? Or if that person's going to ask you about other parts of your job and, and assume if somebody does the reviewing, it doesn't have to be you. There's a certain amount of reviewing that's selfishly beneficial. We see this with, with grant proposals, that if you review a few proposals, if you sit on review panels, you learn how to write them successfully and people volunteer. And then later when people are successful, they often stop volunteering because they don't see the benefit. I think there's lots of mechanisms there. Economics can teach us many lessons. We can require within certain communities that if you're going to author, you need to also provide a certain number of reviews. 
We can do financial compensation and rewards. There's lots of mechanisms, but it starts with valuing it. And probably the biggest mechanism we should be thinking about is how do we train and nurture the people who are willing but not yet very good at reviewing so that we don't simply throw away their volunteer effort and say, this isn't a good reviewer, uh, but instead turn them into a good reviewer. Is there anybody else from the panel who wants to react? You want to? Yeah, I mean, I see this, for example, in my main conference at the SIGCHI flagship conference, that submissions are going up at over 10% or so per year, and the reviewer pool is growing at about 2%. So this is a completely unsustainable uh, situation, and the stakes are so high to get one of these papers that people are submitting more and more and more papers, which makes the problem even worse. And it just goes back to, I think, publishing less and submitting fewer papers is something that we have to start valuing. Yeah, point you made, you made earlier. Next question. Uh, hi. I'm not sure how to put this question, but um, let's imagine that I, um, I think that open science is much more than just making one's work available to everyone, but it also means that everyone should have the possibility to make their work available to everyone. So let's imagine I, I want to change this. Uh, so Professor Constant, I think, said that we are the ones that should make some change, make some effort in changing, but how can we change something if, if in, when in news sometimes we see some universities trying to uh, negotiate with these big publishers and usually <laughs> that doesn't go very well, how if big universities try to negotiate with those publishers, they do not achieve much, how can we achieve whatever we believe is correct? Thank so, you. So I'll give a very short answer to this one. There's five or six steps you can take as an individual that there's no university I've ever heard of that will stop you. Make a personal decision that you're going to engage in certain open practices. Register your hypotheses in advance if you're doing hypothesis-driven research. Make the decision that you're going to publish the work that you have with an open preprint, uh, whether that's archive or another server in your field. Decide you're simply not going to publish in a place that doesn't allow you to do that and put your code, your data, whatever it is that you have that goes with your paper in a repository, whether it's related to the publisher, your institution, or for the area of work that you work in. There are enough publishers, the vast majority of them, will allow you to do all of that and still publish your work under whatever agreement your university has. And then anybody who would like can point people to your work in its preprint form, or in its published form, they can point people to the, to the things they need to build on your work, and you know that you're doing the right thing. And I, if I just may add to that, I mean, I, I think it's extremely important that every individual does what, what he or she can do in that field. And for those that, that are convinced that uh, open access of scientific publications is the right way, if nobody would rev review anything but only open access publications, the rest would be gone pretty fast. I'm very happy to see many more questions coming up. We do it in order. <laughs> okay, thank you for this section. My name is Jim Abdugani from Nigeria. Uh, my question is, uh, late uh, April this year, I presented my research in a conference in my university. But the problem I have is, uh, he said I should pay for the publication. But the question I'm having for the panelists is, is HLF providing a platform for us to publish our paper for free? That's my question. Who, who wants to, to... Can you repeat? So, so I, I think in the, in the different fields, there are, of course, platforms where you... The archive, right, where, where you can uh, put this. But also, I would say that, that open access journals normally have a budget. And this, this counters the argument that, 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 uh, that people that cannot pay for it are, um, are, are not treated correctly. So, so open access journals normally have a budget for those who cannot pay the cost of publication from their own research budget. Every open access publisher typically has between 5 or 10 percent of their budget reserved for that and the conclusion is they actually never need it. So if this case comes up, you send it to a journal, you ask for the specific funds. Um, probably it can be done like that as well. But maybe some others know better what is specific platforms in this field. I, ca I cannot. And th there are some, by now, quite good quality journals 
which are truly open access and which do not cost anything to the author. We can ask where the money for that comes from. That's typically some subsidy from somewhere else because money has to be invested. You don't get sure. publishing for free. But you can do it. And this also, I wanted to come back to the question, what can you do uh, to achieve uh, open access or achieve that we move more towards uh, culture where everything is openly available. Of course, we could theoretically only publish in open access journals, or we could use journals and flip them and make them open access. Uh, Timothy Gowers um, proposes that. There is practically, it's very, very difficult because you have to publish in good quality journals, and good quality journals need a long time to establish themselves. So. This forces young researchers to publish in certain journals, and these certain journals are very often the traditional ones, and of course the names and the brand name is owned by a publisher. So this is why one of the reasons why it's very, very time-consuming and difficult to make this transition. But there are ways, there are possibilities to influence that, and it's easier for a senior colleague to publish in open access because he or she will be less uh, dependent on uh, this immediate recognition than, say, young researchers. Next. Hi. Uh, so I'm really happy that some of the panelists mentioned the publish or perish culture because I always hated that culture because uh, I didn't get into research to become a paper machine, and that's exactly how I feel sometimes. I'm just there to bring attention to sponsoring institutions, agencies, and so on, right? Um, but of course, if we want to get away from this culture, we need to talk about metrics. Because as a computer scientist, I think one of the most important pieces that brings impact to people is software. And, and I, I, I went to a workshop a few years ago, and one of the keynote speakers, they even mentioned, I can't get tenure uh, by writing software because no one is actually investigating how is the impact of that software in other people's research. So then my question to the panelists is, do you know if there is any work in terms of metric, how we can actually measure the impact in other ways that is not the number of publications or even the top venue that you publish? I guess that's a question for the e-infrastructure reflection group. Oh yes, um, it's a very good question. Unfortunately, I don't have the answer. I'm very sorry. Yeah, I mean, I've got one comment on that, which is something that I really like, which is artifact badging. Um, and this is a review process that, uh, for example, ACM has in certain communities to review those artifacts once your paper is accepted and actually archiving the artifact alongside the publication. So you have this other material that's there and you can search by badges and the badges have different levels of reproducibility and, and openness. And I think this is a kind of nice first step in that direction of showing the value of research artifacts beyond the printed word, which is often not the huge part of the publication. My personal experience is that only at the top, really top universities, they don't count papers. You can get tenure with one or two papers. They are sufficiently self-assured to give it to you if they think that the, paper is, the papers are worth it. Yeah, um, I would like to mention one thing. Uh, in ZB Math, we also have SW math. This is for software, and this is um, a way how you can see which software has been used in which mathematical papers. So this is one way how you can demonstrate that, say, software or some other artifact has been valuable to other people. There is also a, a long discussion at the moment uh, about research data, and then we come into all these questions of how do we quote, uh, cite software, how do we so uh, cite research data, um, in exactly in order to, of course, A, reference them properly, but also demonstrate the value of this work that has been done. Uh, that, that's an ongoing discussion, uh, but it's, it's certainly an important one. So I, I want to push back on your argument that you need metrics. Your institution may believe it needs metrics, but your institution is filled with a bunch of people with expertise who will ask other people with expertise about your work. And there's no replacement for reading papers and talking to experts about the impact that a piece of software has had. 
That said, there have been certain documents, manifestos over the years that have helped people who do experimental work make the case as to why they should be promoted. In the US, probably the most influential was a National Research Council report on experimental computer science and engineering in the early 1990s that came out and said, if you measure these people the way you measure everyone else, you're not going to have anybody in academia doing experimental computer science and engineering. You need to value the artifacts. You need to recognize that a single paper may take several years as you build up the artifacts. And that was probably partially responsible for a thousand tenure cases, including my own. Uh, there have been others who have taken much more sophisticated measures of software today of saying, well, we're going to now track download counts we're going to ask people what they do with that software. And the cases I see today of people whose software is a major contribution are making not just a quantitative, but a qualitative argument. Having leaders in the field make the case that, hey, without this software, we couldn't have advanced graphics. We couldn't have developed this processor. We couldn't have proved this theorem. And that's the kind of thing that will advance you. And if you're really stuck at a place that does nothing but respect counts, then go make sure that you're counting everybody who looks at every page you have and every download so that you have something to supplement the really important qualitative judgments of your work. If I just may also, I don't know if my microphone is on, yes, now it's on again. <laughs> Uh, if I also might, uh, might want to react to that. I think um, it's also very important to, to discuss this issue and it's good that there's awareness about this issue and, and ideas on how it, it should be done differently are very important. In, in, for instance, in, in Germany, the, the DFG, the, the research funding organization, has gone away from the fact that in the past they always wanted, for instance, a list of publications. Now they just want your five most important publications, right? And, and, and not a whole list or something, but those papers that uh, you think are important and they want to see the papers, right? They want to, you, you to send them. This is still not the final solution, but it shows there, there is awareness. People are thinking of how we can improve the system and we really need all your input, and that's why I'm very happy with the suggestions and, and questions that come up from your side uh, to, and to improve the system. The floor is yours. <laughs> I'm a bit short for this. <laughs> um, if I may uh, just comment on that last question myself uh, before I ask my question. Uh, in speaking about metrics for open science, uh, I'm currently, I've just joined the Replicats team. And there's a very large project that's just begun that was uh, spearheaded by Brian Nosek, who, who was um, you know, a big part of beginning the replication crisis and the conversation about this. And he ran a project about 10 years ago that exposed, um, as many of you would know, the problems in nature and science and the replication and the reproducibility of results. Uh, he now has a grant to, uh, there's a massive grant, $100 million grant by DARPA to run uh, a study in, and what we're trying to do, I'm, I've joined the reproducibility team as a data analyst, and we're trying to develop a metric of rep, rep, reproducibility and replication for studies. This is the first phase, so we're in a, a sort of a qualitative um, data gathering phase at the moment, but uh, I think that's a really interesting project that's happening in open science, and it's, uh, I don't know how well we'll answer it, but I think it's an important question to be asking. If I, if I may ask there, is, is that for, for all fields or is that specifically social psychology or something? Or it what? would be focused on social science, yes, okay. because it's okay. coming out of NOSEC and um, I'm working with the, well, I'm, I'm currently working with the Philosophy of Science Interdisciplinary Meta Research Group at Melbourne Uni. Um, so they're, they're bringing in lots of different fields. I mean, I myself am in computation and mathematics. Uh, so... It applies to other things, but it's very focused on social okay. science, this project, yes. May I add, I think it's very interesting, and that's exactly, I think, the situation we have in Europe at the moment with the European Open Science Cloud. Yeah, so you, if you want to have open data, yeah, if you have, let's call it a physics experiment, it makes no sense just to have the paperwork, but not the data and the code and everything yes. which you use to run this experiment. 
Yes. Unfortunately, if you think about it, it's not that easy to store the code yeah, because it runs under a certain operating system and all the software you libraries don't exist question. anymore. So all this is at the moment discussed and I'm glad that you do that the same exercise. So what they do at the European Open Science Cloud, they try to offer these repositories yeah, as you mentioned, at least mm. you can put it in a repository. Yes. But at, I think at the moment, that's why I said I don't have the answer. No. I think we are exactly at that moment, we are in the stage that we have to develop something in that direction. Well, that leads directly to my question. Oh. So, <laughs> um, perfect, thank you. Uh, so, my PA I love this panel because my PhD is in reproducible computing within statistics. Okay. So, this is very much to my taste. And, Something that, you know, even in statistics and computing, we're not trained in this aspect of sharing data. There's a huge obstacle in terms of training, where it's well and good to talk about best practices in scientific computing, but most of us are not trained in formal computer science, version control, online repositories, um, cloud computing. I myself did undergraduate mathematics. I learned to solve equations. So my question for the panel, I'd be really interested in how do we disseminate these skills to researchers when that's not really their domain? I mean, even for those of us in statistics and mathematics, our domain is not in that side of computation. Our domain is something else. So how do we develop good enough practices that are realistically adoptable by researchers who are not first and foremost a computer science who specializes in online access of data? Who wants to take that question? I'll, I'll take the first cut at it, which is the other thing we're not trained at doing very well is asking for help. Because there are people out there who specialize in this. In our university, they're within the libraries. The librarians aren't just waiting to say, hey, uh, can you help me find this journal article anymore? They know you find it yourself. They're out there saying, hey, we can help you plan archiving of research, we can help you plan a whole strategy of dissemination. And what I've found is there's a whole network of these librarians, at least in the US and Europe, I don't know if this is worldwide yet, but I suspect it's growing that way, who in their training are being trained not as classical librarians, but as data librarians. Um, that's an analogous situation to the people I deal with on the medical side where no medical researcher I know ever does a study alone. They have a team and they have a statistician and they have a data person and they recognize that there are certain things that don't need to be their expertise. They'll rely on others. At least in our cases, these librarians are sitting underused, available for free. If people come to them, they ask, come at the beginning. Come at the time you're making your research plan. Don't come after you did it wrong and ask us to help you fix it. We'll try, but come when you're making your research plan, when you're writing your proposal, and we will help you develop a viable plan that works with the right fields. I would also point out, though, that especially when you're talking about the crisis that exists in social science, but this is true in parts of computer science as well, the crisis is not just about putting data out and making things amenable to replication. The thing that caused this problem in fields like psychology was the idea of worshipping a p-value and then at the same time having computing and experimental technologies that allowed us to run a million studies and convince ourselves that a thousand of them were really significant because they could only happen by chance one time in a thousand. And um, if we don't take the next step of saying that our research questions are grounded in theory, or separated from their exploration and their validation, and actually registering those questions, hypotheses, and designs in advance will simply fall into the case of sharing and sharing more data that other people can't replicate anything from because it was a fluke. And, and that doesn't help anybody. So Yuli, you wanted to react to that? Or? Yeah, yeah, so I mean, it's having the data sets and everything be open is not enough. It has to actually be usable. It has to be in a format that's reasonable. Um, and I know probably most of us have data sets that if we looked back at them from 10 years ago, we have no idea what's in these files. But I think there's some tools that can make this a lot easier. So things like, since I converted to doing my analysis in Python notebooks, that's made a huge difference. But it does mean the legwork that goes into those analyses have to be uh, 
There's a lot more, and there's a lot of uh, trust you know, that you're putting out there to give that level of scrutiny in your publications. So it's one thing to say, yes, I'll publish my R scripts, or yes, I'll publish my, my Python notebooks, but it's uh, putting yourself out there in a way that has not really been done uh, so often before, and it can be a scary thing. But I think it's worth it. So that I wanted to mention something. In this country, we are currently having a complicated process uh, reorganizing our way how we deal with research data. It's called NFTE, Nationale Forschungsdaten Infrastruktur, so National Research Data Infrastructure. So the government has said we have a problem with research data, with the availability, with fair usage, etc., etc. We have to organize that. Of course, it's an international problem, but so the German government has said we have to address that question. And currently, uh, there's a big uh, proposal, um, or a big sum of money which has been put on the market and in, there are now various consortia forming in the different fields. There's one in mathematics, there are in physics I think two or three, uh, and these consortia try to sort of combine the various players and to address that question of how do we deal with research data, how do we store them, make them usable, how do we actually manage to implement these fair principles. But it's a huge, huge job. Uh, and it's not just data, it's about our algorithms and how we build the, yeah. the trust. I mean, another aspect is unit testing and bringing um, badge counts for, say, in R, we use cover R to measure unit tests, but the, I, I, I just did an analysis for my last paper and only one quarter of R packages have any unit tests at all. So I, I, would, I would also, I mean, as was also remarked by the first reaction you got, I, I think within the university there's always a lot of knowledge on each of these specific topics. And I think better use should be made of that in general, not only the library, in, in the library, right? And, and um, at our university we, we made the mathematicians indeed uh, team up with the social scientists to, uh, to, to get some things better straightened out and, and have discussion groups about specific topics. I would like to ask for a, the next question in a row. Thank you very much. Hi, hello. Uh, when I've been thinking about like the most of the problems that we have been discussing, uh, excess number of publication, the load for the reviewers, I always came up to one uh, core uh, problem, so it, which is what we measure and the, our inability to measure the uh, quality of our work. So simply the number of citations might not be the best way to quantify it. We can say do all citations created equally. and what we can do to uh, make those systems more fair, like automated systems may, might have their own biases, uh, reviewing process might have institutional biases. So where do we st start to develop a new system to evaluate or quantify the quality of science? Is, do, does uh, this start from a publishing venues, academic institutes, or researchers itself? You, you want to add? Okay, one word. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I formulate a meta-theorem that every formal system, formal metric can be manipulated, beaten. Uh, top universities, in top universities they read papers. At lesser universities they rely on age index, number of citations, because it's just convenient for administrators. They don't need to think. Yeah, but and I mean, his point is right. Like, I'm sorry, his point is from... Yeah, it is right. Often, as you just said, the universities do rely, for example, on the age index because it's easy. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. You just go there and you get a number. What do, more do you want? Yeah, yeah. that's easy. Yeah. So I do understand totally your question. I think in, yeah, often it is done that way. So, so I think that the answer is, in the end, only experts can evaluate other scientists, right? And you need expert committees or expert other staff at universities to do this. It's a very time-consuming uh, process and that's why not uh, for all levels that is done and it should be done but there are more people that wanted to react to it. Julie was first. Uh, uh, just a quick comment. I mean one of the things that this whole publishing world uh, lives because we have faith in the review, peer review process and we think it's a good process um, and there's some really nice initiatives so openreviewing.org I believe is their, uh, their name. That's a really exciting kind of idea because you do have then this visibility of the work that goes into reviewing um, and recognition of that reviewing process 
And it's nice to, to see something like that happening, especially in a double-blind reviewing system. So there are some exciting initiatives, but, but I'm not if sure if it a, solves the issue. But if you're a junior researcher, do you uh, consider yourself like not biased uh, reviewing a senior person's paper? Because in, even in the peer review process, there are lots of intrinsic biases that we should address in order to uh, quantify research in a better way. Yeah, well, there's a huge number of biases, and that's why we see it's uh, a little bit frightening when uh, conferences like NeurIPS do an analysis of, of bias and noise and reviewing, but we still have this baseline of trust that peer review is a good system, and I'm not sure if it is, but, uh, I mean, there are, there are a lot of issues there. I think we simply don't have a better system yet, and, and but, so but I think Klaus well, wanted to say. Um, yeah, one, just yesterday we had a meeting of the board of the German Mathematical Society and we addressed that question. So we've published, uh, we've passed uh, a memorandum on how to use or not use bibliometric data in research assessment. And we've made it very clear. Uh, well, one thing to be said is we have to be careful because we sort of all do it ourselves. So if we are on a job committee or if we are on a grant committee, we do look at how many papers, where has the person published. We do look a little bit at citations. However, we made it very, very clear that practically every numerical algorithm can fail and can be manipulated. And I fully agree to that. And sort of the message we've sent in that statement is never do anything without peer review. Now, peer review can also have its pitfalls, but we very clearly say never do it without peer review. And I must say that... Double blind peer review. Hmm? <laughs> I would add in, without double blind. In this, in this country, we are reasonably fortunate. I do not know of many universities where they have these very rigid numerical algorithms, but I believe in some other countries it is different. So I, I think we should recognize that the fact that we're all inherently lazy and would love to have a number rather than read your papers, is also something you can use to your advantage systematically in changing the system. I mean, hearken back to those papers way back, or the talks way back in the morning. We have technologies that you or someone else in this room could say, you know, what if I got a bunch of those top university assessments of people that were done with all the careful work and I dumped in all of the metric data I can find and tried to learn a scoring system to put alongside the other metrics. And it would be an interesting exercise to see if you could build one that people had greater confidence in than they had in the H index or in some of these other things. Because we know those, those metrics have problems. They're skewed by subfield, they're skewed by a lot of things. I don't think we have to give up on metrics, I just think we can't rely solely on them. I, I totally agree, but do you think if we train such a model using existing data, do we learn what we should really value the research, or we will learn the intrinsic biases of the publication system or the <laughs> editors or other things? Uh, I, I think what's critical is that the outcome you're training towards cannot be did they get papers in the top venues. It has to be something where you look back at career-long impact, and I'm fully rec recognizing the fact that that data, because of the system, will have been skewed. It will have been skewed against women. It will be, have been skewed against disadvantaged minorities, and we're going to have to figure out how to move beyond that skew and attempt to oversample the data in those communities to be able to build something that can actually attempt to do something useful. None I, of that will replace the fact that the best places would rather rely on human judgment, but it might at least give us a fighting chance that what we're not out there doing is encouraging rings of people to cite each other in the hopes that we all get promoted because we now have lots of citations from our friends. So in that, and the panel doesn't agree on all points. In this, in this point, I, I stick with Efim on, on his statement that I think any metrics will be, will be really difficult. Um, I, I point out that all universities in, in Europe and all research organizations worldwide have probably all signed the San Francisco DORA Declaration, Declaration on Research Assessment, where, for instance, rule number one is that citation impact scores should never be looked at 
and still everybody uses it. So, so it, is, it is a problem, it needs to be addressed. I'm looking at the clock, we have five to 15 minutes. There are several people standing behind you. I would like to give Thank them you. all a chance. Thank you very much. Next question. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much, and the panel has been super insightful. Uh, my question pivots from the previous uh, line of discussion. I wanted to know how, as a community, can we encourage publishing negative results, uh, spe specifically in my area of research, machine learning and artificial intelligence. We mostly see how models, deep neural networks and other models has exceeded all baseline models. But I think as a researcher, it is super helpful to see what did not work in certain scenario and what objective function doesn't work for a sequence data, for example. And I know from my experience that a three-layer neural network doesn't always work. Maybe a traditional Markov chain works better. How as a community, but papers don't get accepted unless we show something that beats magically all other baselines. So, do you have a... I would like to, uh, yeah. Well, this, as a mathematician, it's a bit hard to address this question. So if I address a negative, it can be theorem, the, uh, the circle cannot be squared. Yeah? <laughs> and then, of course, it's a big result. Uh, so in, in mathematics, I find that hard to answer. Uh, but in the experimental sciences, I can see the point because you can then save other people doing the same work. On the other hand, sometimes repeating something and going slightly different can also be an advantage. But maybe somebody could answer that who is closer to the experimental science. Yes, yeah, so, so what, I, what I think from my field, experimental physics, I mean, there's not a real journal where you would go publish negative results, but a PhD thesis very often serves <laughs> as that. And the, in, in, a sense, in a sense that a PhD thesis not only presents the positive results and the articles that came out, but has a much broader scope and a much wider description of also all these other things that are being tried. It used to be that these PhD theses in the past were difficult to get to, were diff difficult to access. Of course, that is now uh, com completely different. Many, many people argue that there should be journals specifically for, this, uh, for, for these topics. Um, but I've, I've never seen them flourish, I've never seen them come up. So there, there seems to be some intrinsic uh, limitation in this. Um, so I think, I, I don't I think know we should learn, though, in, in the health sciences, it's the one field that does this well. And they recognize, as we need to, that not every negative result is interesting. If you really want to be able to publish a negative result, you probably need pre-review before you did the experiment that has somebody come back and say, the theory you're trying to test is sound, your methods are sound, it will now be interesting if it turns out that you didn't find the result you expected. In, in clinical studies, you see this. Somebody says we have every reason to believe that aspirin's going to reduce your blood pressure. There's literature about this. We have the right power in our study. We have a reasonable sample. If we don't find it, you get that published. Uh, if we do find it, you get that published. It's, it's a nice system, but I think we need to think about evolving to have for that kind of work a two-stage process where your design has been reviewed by peers who can acknowledge that yes, if you carry this out, we believe a negative result would actually advance our knowledge in the field and not just simply be evidence that you failed. You know, if I fail to prove a theorem, is it because the theorem's not true or because I'm really bad at proof? <laughs> That's not a good negative result. You have to have some theory and a comfortable design behind it. There's actually the, 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 the reverse exists in some field. There's a very famous journal in organic chemistry where people always report the production, the synthesis of a certain compound. Paper is only accepted if an other group independently reproduces the production of that same chemical compound. That takes a long time uh, before the paper then is accepted, but it's, it's the, the most prestigious and highly cited uh, paper in the field. Okay, but I try to, try to go on with, the, I see three more questions at least, and um, so I'll give you all the chance to, or two more. There is another question from the audience. Well, some people. Can okay. Okay, I'm Raymond Seidel, I'm the scientific director of Schloss Darkstuhl, which uh, for the mathematicians among you is kind of the in computer science version of Oberwolfach. So like Oberwolfach, we have a seminar program, which is about the same size as Oberwolfach, 
In addition, we started running DBLP, which is a bibliography database which many of you use. And we also have a small open access publication program, which publishes something like 1,800 to 2,000 papers per year. Now, we're mathematicians, computer scientists. We know how to deal with numbers, but they're still abstract. Let me make things a little concrete. If we were to receive 2,000 euros for every paper we publish, we would not just run our publication efforts. We would run the seminar program, we would run TBLP, and we would have money left over. So this gives me the impression that the current system where things are so expensive is actually a huge public subsidy program for investors in various publication companies. And I think our natural reaction should be to get away from those companies altogether and find new ways of dealing with this. When I say dealing with this, is, as uh, one member of the panel said, uh, maybe publication is not so much about dissemination of knowledge anymore, but about getting cookie points for promotion or whatever. So maybe we should look at the system in a completely different way. Yes, knowledge has to be disseminated, but this is relatively easy. It's more a question of how do you get a stamp of approval? What mechanisms do you have for that? Yeah, so... You, you're, you're absolutely right. And the 3,800 euros per article that I mentioned is, is a scandal, you could say. And, and why is that? Well, well, for instance, I mean, the, the CEO of Relics, which is the company that owns Elsevier, he's paid out in pounds per year. The pound is at its lowest value now, but it's still more than 10 million euros per year, right? That he gets as a salary. This is research money. You probably don't get that running the business you're running, right? And, and so there is, the, the, the system needs to be changed. We need to come up with all kind of alternative and new models. Um, why am I personally still spending quite a lot of time to negotiate with the major publishers? Because if we really want to change the field, they just have right now 50% of the market. And if we are realistic, we're only going to change things if we find some compromise solution with them. This is not the ideal solution. It's not the final one. But at least it is better than what we had in the past. That's, that's how I see it. But I support all kinds of initiatives to do it differently, to do it more modern, to do it cheaper, to do it more transparent, and so on. That all needs to change. But we also have to be realistic that we are in the situation that we're now in. Maybe somebody else also wants to, wants to react. And otherwise, I go on with the next question. I also see there's a question uh, from the audience, but one in line first. You, you'll get also a question. Uh, hello. Uh, thanks for uh, all the answers. I have a simple question that there's some SCI index, uh, science citation index. So it uh, index both high quality journals uh, like IEEE transaction, ACM transaction, along with uh, very low quality journals. So in many places, any bad quality journal and good IEEE transaction or ACM transaction counted both as one, means both has same value, means a good person and good researcher or bad researcher both got the equal advantage. So why IEEE and ACM like organizations are not working on the direction of creating a standard list that will create standards of A quality journal or conference, B quality journal or conference, C quality journal or conference and after that there is no nothing which is acceptable as a research. Means the other things were just uh, online documentation, that's it, like a blog. So why uh, IEEE and ACM is not initiating like SCI index? So I think, I think there's a very short answer to that. Yes. Frankly, if IEEE and ACM got together to do that, that would almost certainly violate U.S. antitrust law mm -hmm. and laws in other places and attempt to monopolize, even if we included all of what we think are good venues in other places from other publishers and attempt to 
basically block people from getting credit in certain things would be viewed as anti-competitive. I can't speak for what IEEE does. I know that ACM works with people who put together their own lists. For instance, the China Computer Federation, its communities put together lists of what they think are good venues, and we try to work with them to help them identify from ours which ones we think are the ones that are the top venues and the second tier venues so that researchers will recognize these are places they want to publish. Everybody who makes a list has different criteria. Every country that makes a list has different criteria. Some want things that have high impact. Some want things that are highly selective and reject a lot. And I think we mostly hate these scores and lists, but we've had a long discussion about metrics that I won't try to repeat. So why we don't give funds to csranking.org like organization? They will add more list and have a big server working behind that and uh, having lots of authors listed in it, which has relatively less quality uh, publications. Like the csranking.org only listed uh, very topmost conferences hardly 40, 50 conferences. So only authors of those 40, 50 conferences are being listed and rest after that, uh, even it doesn't list it, IEEE or ACM transactions. I mean, I, I wonder whether I understand it. Is your suggestion to make a list of uh, some kind of ranking of conference proceedings yeah. or journals? Yeah. Okay, so I can, in mathematics, some Examples of that exist. Yes. For example, there's a Norwegian list. Um, the Australians tried it once. Yes. Uh, the Norwegian list is fairly harmless, I believe. Um, and typically, it's a distinction between A, B, and C journals. Yes. Um, we discussed it at the German Mathematical Society, and we very soon found that we can't really agree because it depends on which part of mathematics we are talking about, uh, many other aspects, so we just gave it up. Um, I know that the economists, uh, at least that's what I've been often told, is they do have an ABC list and they actually seem to believe in it and work with it, but in mathematics the discussions I've been involved in were not fruitful and in the end we gave up on that. Okay, with that, there are, if you have the time, there are still two questions. Um, quick questions, quick answers. Oh, one, one question. Okay. I thought you were also going to ask a question. Thank you. <laughs> um, I've um, been aware of what Gauss said when he was criticized for publishing very few papers. Paukam said maturam. Few, but mature. And that's been my policy since I became an assistant professor. Um, and then when I moved to California and I was being paid by the uh, taxes of the uh, citizens of California, I found that the reviewing process and the publication process was extremely o onerous. And so I post things on my web page. Now there is a service which tells you how often various things have been cited. I can't remember the name of it because I don't pay a great deal of attention. Uh, but every now and then, something bursts into my email and it says, this such, such an article achieved a new record, or whatever that was, but I don't follow it up, I'm not interested. Um, now, I could count the citations, I suppose, and say that gives us an idea of the quality, but in fact, there are a lot of strange things on my web page. For example, there's an article titled How Blabbermouthed German U-Boats Got Themselves Sunk in World War II. Of course, I'm a mathematician and computer scientist. I suppose it would be hard to explain why that's on my web page. But I get all sorts of email from people who say, oh yeah, uh, I was in on that, or Yes, that happened to me, and so on. So I guess there are people who read that too. And then there is the paper uh, that I collaborated on, except I finally came to the conclusion that it was a bad idea. And I asked to have my name removed. 
but it wasn't. And somehow, that's got lots of citations too. Um, goodness, I guess people are indiscriminate, and it may be that when we ask to have papers reviewed, an enormous burden falls upon the reviewer. And it falls upon the editor too to find a competent reviewer. And quite often, they both fail. So reviewing is not the cure. Thank you. I think that that is a very wise and interesting comment at the end of this, uh, of this panel discussion. I see you're standing up. I think we have the task to stay in time. I'm sorry to have gone one minute over time. I'm very thankful for the active participation of the audience in the discussion and the questions that came up. Um, it's, you have to believe me, it's always more enlightening for the people sitting in the panel than, uh, than, than for the audience. Um, I learned a lot today. I found it very interesting. I want to thank all the panel members for their participation in that. I thank you. And with that, I close and give the word back to you.